Listen, D, I want to talk to you about how uh, young men, women, sports just use their voice for good and don't let the whites to define you and tell you what you can and cannot do. I feel like too many times in sports, they want to play the PC role mm -hmm. and not really express them to tell, tell the truth. They want to keep the status quo happy. And I think that's wrong. Yeah, um, well, this kind of changed over time, I think. And uh, sometimes we don't maybe acknowledge or know about that legacy. And so if we think historically, like I like to remind people or to share with people that you had black athletes even during enslavement. So you had uh, horse racing was popular uh, in the South and you had black boys and men who were training and riding um, um, jockeys. And so they, I'm sure they had to navigate, you know, their life, uh, their lives as athletes and as um, being someone living in bondage. And so, you know, there, I'm sure are examples of resistance, even in those circumstances. And then um, we, we move forward, we look at the fact that, um, you know, Black people have uh, excelled in sports that we don't even associate Black people with anymore, like with uh, cycling, uh, for example, uh, and how whenever, you know, Black people start doing really well at something, as um, Bill Roden has said, um, white folks like to change the rules, and he calls that the jockey uh, syndrome. And so Black people have always been fighting in the world of sports and using their platform to try to um, show the injustices that exist and to try to combat them. And of course, we know about uh, Tommy Smith, uh, for example, and uh, John Carlos in the 1968 um, Olympics. And, and rightly so, some people will say that some uh, athletes got a little quiet during Michael Jordan's era and uh, Tag when Tiger Woods was uh, at his prime, when he famously, you know, said that he was Cablasian, even though everyone was <laughs> referring to him as a, <laughs> as a black golfer. Um, but uh, since the killing of George Floyd, and even before that, you know, thinking about uh, Miami Heat, when um, LeBron James was still there and how they wore hoodies in solidarity with um, everyone who was protesting the killing of, of uh, Trayvon Martin. You know, we started to see um, this younger generation to, to use their platform. And what I have been impressed with since the killing of George Floyd is that college athletes college athletes who are perhaps in the most unfair power dynamic of all athletes have said, you know what, I don't care. <laughs> I'm most going to use my platform and bring attention to a host of issues, including issues related to uh, racial injustices. And Lori, you know, from my listeners, I've heard this from my listeners, Lori. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you talk about political issues? Why do you talk about these issues? I said, first of all, I'm a black male. And this is my little experience. Now, mm -hmm. when you live in your boxed in suburb, you don't have to worry about this. And last week, Lori, a listener called up here who was Italian try to tell me that he wasn't white and he was he's has black he's Sicilian and I'm like I said 1940 America recognized Italians as being white and when you get put over by the police they said look at you as white okay and they look at me say nah you're a black male and that slave patrol which, which the police comes out of I'm gonna attack you say I, I he said that Lord he said well I can tell I have a concealed carry well I say that I still might end up dead so. There's a difference. So if it's, it's, it's claiming that you're Sicilian and you're black, you're get mixed with African, and I'm like, please. Well, if you ain't carrying the struggle and you ain't got to worry about your life every time you leave your house, you're not black in America. Italians are considered to be white, even though, yes, Sicilians were mixed with Africans and they're, they're darker than northern Italians, but you're still white in this country. And Lori, that set off a whole straw on my show last week, but I tell them the truth. You you can't claim it, and because because the privilege you have is still in it's made America. You're white. You can get to survive police encounters, and I don't. You know, there's so much there <laughs> because I mean, historically, we can say, yeah, in, in the United States, um, people from Southern, Eastern, and Central Europe at at one time when they came here in large numbers between 1880 and 1920 were not considered to be white in the way that we think about white people today. They were. So, uh, so they were looked at as distinct uh, racial groups. Uh, but as you mentioned, there are different ways that they were assimilated um, through uh, owning property, through the school system and so forth. Those same systems that kept 
black people at the bottom of the social structure. So this idea that everybody, you know, faced discrimination and should have the same chance to overcome it didn't work like that. That's not historically um, accurate. But what it also points to is that, you know, race goes beyond just biology, that it's a social construct and it changes uh, over time and that we attach different meanings to different uh, racial categories. And so you can call yourself anything you want to, but as you mentioned, that's not necessarily how I'm um, going to connect with how you uh, experience the world based upon your race. So um, we've seen it time and time again where some people want to, uh, you can use the word pass if you want, uh, or pretend they're from another racial or ethnic group, uh, and they're you know treated the way in which society sees them. So again, you can call yourself what you want, but if you have um, um, uh, physical features that people associate with blackness, then they're going to treat you with the same anti-blackness that's characterized American history even before it was uh, founded. And exactly. And you know what, Lori, what I try to tell people all the time is unless you live the experience that black people live, you can't speak on it. It's because you're around black people. You have black friends. You don't fully understand because you can still go back to be who you are once you leave from my, from my presence. Okay. And like that's why also I talked about this with my people who are mixed. Like they have an option to either choose the white side or the black side, and but they all had that wake up call because they were they're never gonna be white, okay? But they always like they always have that wake up call that you're you're not. And I'm like, hey, you can play that game if you want to, but eventually I'm gonna remind you that you're not. And so what I feel like is Lori that in our country. Things are seen through the prism of whiteness, and that's what I was about about that. And and, and they all say, "Look presentable, assimilate to what? I'm my own man. I'm not gonna assimilate to your pur purview of life, no matter what, no matter what I do." So I feel like the, the disconnect is here: is that white people in our country, and uh, what athlete elites and in this in general want us to assimilate to their view of the world. And that's not how our construct is as black people in this country, and in, in the African diaspora as, as a whole as well. Yeah, so you remind me of something that I try to share with people every time I get the opportunity, and that is the difference between the politics of respectability and respectability politics. So sometimes people use those uh, interchangeably. And um, respectability politics, as you know, and kind of alluded to, is where you know people claim that if you dress a certain way or you act a certain way when you encounter law enforcement or someone else, that you know, you're going to have a more positive outcome than if you dress in a way that they view for whatever reason in their imagination uh, as uh, threatening. Well, so the politics of respectability is actually a concept of, that uh, Evelyn Higginbotham wrote about um, when she was doing research on Black Baptist women in the uh, late 1800s and early 1920s. And these Black women, sure, they were saying some things that were, you know, pretty judgmental relative to um, black women who are of a lower socioeconomic status, but they were not under the illusion that if they just dressed a certain way and didn't go to, you know, dance halls and play cards <laughs> that they'd have a better life and no longer have to uh, work largely as domestic servants. But in addition to talking about things that they could control and con trying to control their own uh, image as black women, they also fought against lynching. They also fought for affordable housing they bought um, for you know greater opportunities employment and voting it and the like and so when people talk about respectability politics that's one thing about you know window dressing for the dominant group but when they talk about the politics of respectability that's where we add that social justice component where you know you are trying to control your own image and uh, your own destiny and create a more just society Lori yes that's, that's all my point exactly Lori you know Lori is funny on this show here, I lost nine sponsors last year, but I've gained 13 because okay. I'm speaking the truth, right? They ran away from me. I'm too tough. He's radical. I said, my life is not radical. This is what mm -hmm. I live, okay? It's because you don't understand it. God help you, you know? So it's like, just in business, why it's last year since George Floyd, I started talking about stuff beyond sports, real life issues, which I actually enjoy more. Because, Lord, you should, you should see the emails I get. And, oh, Jr., I love the show better when you were talking about just sports only. I wish you would just go back to sports. Well, those days are over. 
this is a sports show to discuss is real life stuff too as well. So <laughs> deal with it. Either you like it or you don't. Find another sports show that talks to you about the Braves, Hawks, Falcons, all that, all that long. This is going to be about more than that. Okay, I have a platform and number nine nine media market in the country. We're going to use it for good and educate people. If you want to be educated and empowered, find another show. Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing um, that you received uh, more sponsorships uh, when, uh, you know, once you decided that you're going to take a stand and not look back. And it's really important. And, you know, I think it's it's really laughable that some people really think about sports in 2021 and really think that is just about entertainment and it has nothing to do with um, the rest of society as if sports operates in a vacuum. You know, as I just mentioned, you had sports occurring uh, during slavery. How can that not show that there's a relationship between sports and economics and politics and everything? I mean, they're all uh, so connected. And so, yeah, it just makes no sense that um, people, you know, think that um, they can separate sports from the rest of society or that athletes in particular, that they should just, as we've heard, shut up and play, right? You're just there to entertain me, not to talk about your experiences or what's going on um, in the world. But I was happy to see um, some of the things that the Hawks have done in terms of just connecting with civil rights organizations in the, in the city uh, and even changing changing the, uh, the floor and the court. It's just really great things happening uh, in some spaces. And Laura, you know what's funny is that, you know, people cheer for like LSU and cheer for Alabama, these fans, but they don't, they don't care about the, the guys once they leave the field. Win, win, win the game for me on Saturday, but screw you and your, your life the rest of the week. We don't care. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what we talk about amongst ourselves, amongst us black players. We're like, okay, we want to cheer for us when we went playing, he was representing their favorite team, but they don't care about our lives besides our favorite team. And see, we're fighting for humanity. So that tells me you're not for humanity. Because if you don't care about my life past entertaining you for three hours on, on a field or a court, you ain't real. You just want entertainment. Like they use slaves and made slaves as their entertainment. So it's that same mindset, systemic mindset from day one when the first slave came over to Hampton Roads in Virginia, there. The same mindset, 2021. I lost you for a minute. You froze. Oh, yeah. On me. yeah, yeah, you froze up, Laura. You, I think oh. I think you're there. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you were making a point about how uh, fans don't necessarily care about uh, the players once they get off of the field. And Correct. I think that that is so true. Um, but one thing uh, I think that we learned during the pandemic is once they saw the, um, you know, their profit margins reduced because things were uh, shut down. And then some people were forced to listen to the athletes in a way they hadn't listened to them before because it became so clear how much uh, the, you know, their fates as bu business owners in college towns and athletic departments is tied to the labor of these athletes. And so now we're starting to see some movement on things like names, images, and likeness and so forth and um, um, some programs trying to have a more holistic approach approach to their um, interactions with athletes and black student athlete associations uh, popping up all over the country and so that's not a coincidence I think that the pandemic and the killing of George Floyd you know um, created a so-called perfect storm to make some of those changes possible. And Lori, what I've noticed is reading in the polls and reading different articles that, you know, support for Black Lives Matter has went below the, what, what it was before George Floyd was even killed, which tells me that people thought it was a racial reckoning happening last year. So no, it's not. This is just, this is just corporate capitalization of Black death. It's like Black porn again. We don't capitalize on their deaths and just make these empty statements for PR just to keep business like you there, there's no teeth of these actually these companies were saying they was going to do and these people's oh, i believe in this no you don't because if you did you will stop it because it's systemic it's hard to break a system where it benefits you and your kids all these years so i never thought it was gonna be a new reckoning last year i thought that people was naive in that regard some mm -hmm. white people were naive i'm like no it ain't gonna change it just made you more aware but changes can say hey we're gonna stop this and vote against those who don't want to keep it the same exact way. See, I, I, people tell I'll tell them, well, I'm, I'm a good person, JR. I'll say, no, if you support the White Nationalist Party, which the Republican Party, Party is now, then you're not supporting humanity. Because it's obviously they don't support humanity. And say, so as a black man, I got, I got two options. They, they can't stand me, and others may not do nothing for me, but I got to choose the option. Well, I'd rather have a, a Biden-Clinton judge and a Trump judge 
take judging my cases, you know? So it's common sense. It's like, hey, I got two options. You're the better two options. And my interest is always going to be lower. Black interest versus white nationalism, right? Ron Walsh's book was. I love that book. That's how I learned how to think about politics going forward now. Yeah, so you raise a lot of important issues. The one thing that I think is important with some of those studies, and I've seen them that claim that there's um, less support for Black Lives Matter, is that sometimes the methodological approach of those reports are not scientifically sound. And so you've got to read the fine print in terms of how they came to their conclusions. And then also thinking about how they're defining um, Black Lives Matter. Are they talking about people who are literally card carrying members that they have signed up to join a particular chapter because they have them in different states? Or are we talking about people who just want, who see that as a declaration that Black Lives Matter, not that they're part of any particular organization, if this generation hasn't showed us anything is that they don't need one leader to speak for them, that everyone feels empowered to do something in their own communities to mobilize uh, others to address whatever the issue is that needs to be addressed. And so I, I see uh, what some people have called the, uh, since the killing of George Floyd is Black Lives Matter is part of a broader Black liberation struggle that's been going on for hundreds of years. This is the latest iteration I um, mean, the second thing I'll say is you reminded me of a legal scholar who passed away not too well, it's been some time now, uh, Derek Bell, and he wrote about racial realism. And essentially, he said, you know what, it's time to stop fighting for racial uh, equality, we should stop trying to work through the courts and so forth, and that we should just recognize that the system is the way that it is and that it's set up so that Black people will forever be in a subordinate uh, status and that we should just uh, not stop uh, fighting uh, and um, engaging in a struggle, but that we shouldn't get our hopes up and de be disappointed when we just see these little peaks of progress and then go back to business as usual. And so I think that his work is um, helpful in, in helping us uh, stay motivated, but realistic about what can actually change. Lori, I've done a lot of this on my show last year, Lori, is like, do my civics, like, teach you how civics works, like, I know those who want reparations, where I say, we need 218, 60, and the president to sign it, okay, so you gotta find the group of people who are actually going to support it that way, so it's all about, you can't just say, hey, do this, it's gonna happen, you have to have the numbers and the votes to pass the bills and then the laws, so I try to teach my listeners about civics here, because my, my master's in public administration, so I know all about this stuff, so like, Everything you want, it can't happen because they got elected in. They have to have a coalition and numbers to get it done from your school board, your city council, all from the lowest level of politics up to the federal level. You yeah. got to have the numbers to get the initiatives done, the policies done, the amendments done, the bills done. So if you don't have the numbers, you can, you can get upset, but you, don't, but you know how civics works to get the numbers to make it happen. Right. No, you're right about that. Um, which is why we don't see a whole lot of movement <laughs> and a lot of policy uh, initiatives. And I would argue that even when we do, they don't always adequately uh, address the problem, right? Exactly. So um, they may focus on one particular area of an of a issue and yet leave you know, the major issues untouched. And so sometimes the policies end up doing more harm than good. Most definitely. And Laura, you know, I for you guys, when you have your students in class, uh, um, how was it getting those you know, people to re realize, hey, uh, actually reading into these old books like from W.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson, learning about these people who helped form who we are today? Because, you know, I went to Memphis and went to Church Park. I had no idea that Robert Church's park right there on Bill Street wasn't on the the part of Bill Street that people go celebrate on Bill Street. I was like, this, this is Church Park. This is Robert Church. Oh, okay. Now I know who this guy. I read about him. Now I'm at his park here in, on Bill Street in Memphis. So how do you go about approaching these young, teaching these young men and, and women about the key figures in Black history in your, in your classes at African American Studies here in, in LSU there? Yeah, so I think um, what's good about um, the students that we have at LSU and other places around the country is that um, they're really hungry for the education. They want to know for Black students, Black student athletes, for example, and for others, they just want to know the true history. And a lot of um, the students feel robbed when they think about everything they were never told and never learned in elementary school and never learned in uh, high school. So they're quite passionate about it. But I'll tell you, you know, some of the biggest challenges are with some of the um, some of my colleagues. <laughs> 
some of the faculty and professors uh, and as well as um, you know, individuals who are not directly connected with like public institutions uh, in the South, but may make donations or are taxpayers and uh, feel that they have something to say. And yeah, we know there's a movement where you have different states are passing laws where you can't talk about race and racism uh, in, in um, public schools, uh, at the high school level, as well as uh, college and everywhere else. Uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of challenges. And so when you have people with PhDs who you would think would know better, don't want, you know, to talk about race, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a whole other challenge because, you know, you got Black students in their classes, non-Black students in their classes, you know, what are they getting out of it? Um, and, and in many places, African, African-American studies courses are not required, they're electives. Uh, and so only the students who kind of recognize that is important and that they will become better citizens and better leaders and just better people by taking our courses, um, they get the benefit of it. But it should be something that's required of all people and part of, um, you know, K through uh, 12 and beyond uh, education. And Lori, if I didn't go to an AME church as a kid, I would have known about the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre. Mm -hmm. It wasn't ever taught to me in school. Mm -hmm. I learned about that at church, being in AME church, you know, Richard Allen and all those guys who formed mm -hmm. that, that, that the religion I am today. So, like, stuff like that is being kept out of books. And, you know, I went to Tennessee State. We never talked about the Tulsa race riot at Tennessee State even. And that's mm -hmm. the HBCU school. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it was weird that I learned so much from my father and elders around my father and my mother about black history and what I did in school and in college, getting two degrees from that university. Like, wow, like we gotta do a better job in my opinion with the curriculum to really get down and teach people the real truth. And it, yes, the truth hurts, it's not comfortable for some people in this country, mm -hmm. but this is, it's, it's our story of how it happened to us rather than his story. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, and to your point, it's important to change the curriculum so it represents more diverse populations, including the experiences of Black people. Um, we also need um, community-based organizations, including faith-based institutions to do their part as well. You know, we um, have and we have a tradition in some Black churches where for Black History Month, you know, people are reading a report about some historical figure and things like that. We need the continuation of that. Um, the Tony Morrison Society, I know if you're familiar with them, but they have a program called Bench by the Road. And so they've created an outdoor memorial where um, they honor um, certain places where uh, historical things have taken place relative to the Black experience. So in here in Baton Rouge, there was the Baton Rouge bus boycott in 1953. So they dedicated a, a bench and there's a plaque there so people can learn about that. A lot of people who are born and raised in Baton Rouge and don't know anything about the Baton Rouge bus boycott. <laughs> and it happened here in 1953, two years before the one uh, in Montgomery. So we all just have to use our platforms wherever we are to try to educate folks. And so be open to be educated, you know, listening to people who are older and younger uh, than us and then documenting it and sharing it. We have all this access to social media and all these different platforms. We should use it to try to share uh, our great legacy. And I love sitting around with some elders at, at the men's breakfasts at church and learning about history. And uh, it, it, that's what taught me, you know, because I'm an older soul because my parents were older. I was what they call a, a menopause baby, okay? <laughs> I, I was had late. My parents were a little old, older than they had me. So I was a little bit seasoned more than most people my age are at this point because of what I was taught around all, all the elders I was around. So, you know, all this history, like of like I took about saying, you know, more, Morehouse really um, – Atlanta Baptist College is what it really was. So people are like, oh, for real? Yes, it was what it really used to be called. It was Clark College, Atlanta University. Like, they don't really realize they had the history just right up here in AUC, what it, what it was. You know, mm -hmm. Benjamin Lodge and Mays, all these people. So, right. like, Atlanta is so good because so much history here for civil right. rights and so many elders who know about it. We lost three great elders last year who taught us all so much. So I, I really try to teach uh, my millennial generation that, hey, Enjoy these elders before they come ancestors because they have the keys to where it was and give us some wisdom to help us go forward as we navigate this, this life before we transition away from here. So I'm like, it's so key to soak knowledge for elders and, and before they come ancestors. Mm -hmm. No, you're exactly right about that. And again, we have all this technology. We can use it to preserve uh, some of that history. 
most definitely. And Lori, let me ask you this. At LSU, um, how do you all go about teaching these athletes about uh, these, all these things outside of the classroom? Because uh, they have outreach to want to learn about these things beyond just a classroom setting, just on their own, to kind of get knowledge and do things in the community, learn about Baton Rouge and Louisiana, all the history down there for Black people in that, that great state down there that you all in? Yeah, so um, there were a couple of things that we did, and I'll just use the period following the killing of George Floyd as an example. Uh, we collaborated um, in the Department of African and African American Studies with the Athletics Department, and we did um, a book discussion that included uh, students and student athletes as well. We read uh, Democracy in Black by um, Dr. Eddie Gloud, and then later he joined us for a virtual uh, lecture where, again, I was uh, co-sponsored with Department of African and African American Studies in the Athletics Department. I personally went around uh, to each team before their season started and I talked about um, Black Lives Matter and the origins of it and the history of protests during the national anthem. And so we had that level uh, of education. And so I would say that in my experience as being the faculty athletics representative that the Athletics Department at LSU is trying to do more to engage um, all student athletes athletes uh, around social justice issues, but uh, and list, they're also trying to listen to uh, Black student athletes as well. Um, you may or may not know that um, six uh, individuals who are college athletes at LSU actually established a Black Student Athlete Association, and so they've done a, a good job of of educating uh, their peers. They've gone to Instagram and held live sessions uh, so that they could share information. They're engaged in uh, educational um, activities. Uh, you, uh, you know, um, being part of uh, ABIS, that they have a hidden figure um, project where they basically highlight some historical hidden figures uh, in the black experience and to share that with uh, others. And so you have a lot of uh, college athletes who have been engaged around that, educating themselves and turning around and then educating um, kids in like elementary school and others on their uh, feed. So it's a lot going on and uh, glad to see that there's an interest among college athletes to know more about their history and to share that history with others. That's one for you, Lori. This last one for you is this, Lori. Um, how can we help you guys in LSU uh, make more, make things more aware of what you guys are doing down there? Uh, for us to be, uh, how, can, how can we here at the Boss Man Show and here in Atlanta help you guys down there get more people educated and empowered? Well, um, I would appreciate it very much if you would um, continue to support uh, the Department of African African American Studies at LSU. We're the first um, department of African African American studies in the entire state. And that's, you know, really saying something being where we are and it being 2021 20, uh, and at a flagship institution. So just by um, letting uh, students know that they're looking for um, a program that's going to really challenge them and is going to prepare them uh, for the world intellectually uh, and in other ways that um, you should always, as we say, major where you matter. And that's in the Department of African and African American Studies at LSU. Well, Lori, how, how about this? We'll have you on once a month to have a, make sure we can promote the program as so well. You can hear about it so kids in Atlanta can maybe say go to Baton Rouge and go, go down and join the programs. We'll do it help you in that way as well, Lori. If you have it so once a month. That's cool with you. That's, that sounds wonderful. They're always welcome. We'd love to have them. All right, Lori, thank you for your time. We'll do this again real soon, okay? I'll talk to you real soon now. Okay, thank you. All right, bye now. Bye.